Hello. Oh, this is the microtime 200, a single molecule dedicated uh, system for fluorescence measurements and it's a time resource machine. And then like other component uh, microscopes you may have seen, this is a rather uh, big system sitting on this table here. And the uh, special advantage of this system is that you can actually take off the lid and do things here on this microscope. So you can have a look what is going on inside this microscope. Or you can have a look at the confocal uh, setup and let you see here on the right hand side. So basically the whole system consists of three major components. The first one is uh, an inverted microscope stand. Um, the second one is the excitation unit which houses a couple of laser diodes. And we have the main optical unit that contains all the confocal uh, optics, mechano mechanical op yeah, optical mechanics, uh, excitation, and detection unit. Then on the right hand side, we have another box here which contains another two sets of detectors. And so you see this uh, system is quite modular and can be extended with other detection options as well. So if we first go here to the laser box. Uh, in this box, we have uh, four diode lasers and then uh, one fiber coupled uh, uh, green laser. So, the reason for using a dedicated box for the excitation and feeding all the lasers that are housed in this box into a single mode uh, polarization maintaining fiber is um, connected with the beam profile of the lasers, and this is especially true for semiconductor lasers that have a beam profile that looks a little bit elliptic and you can see these kinds of uh, you know, not so nice beam shapes. And now here in this box all the lasers are overlaid so you can couple different kinds uh, of lasers and overlay them and feed them into a single mode polarization maintaining fiber. And now the advantage is that I can do a lot of things to this laser beam for example I can use a kind of a knife to cut away portions of the beam to reduce the intensity. If you would do this kind of thing to uh, a laser beam and feed the laser beam normally into a confocal microscope, the focus that you would get would be a representation of this kind of distorted beam or cut-off beam, and of course you wouldn't get a nice resolution in your microscope of, uh, image then. So now, by feeding these uh, laser beams into a single mode contain polarization maintaining fiber, on the other side of the microscope, if you walk over here, you see the beam coming out of the microscope, and you can see that the beam shape uh, is nothing compared to the uh, beam shape that we have after the laser diet. You have a, have a nice Gaussian uh, beam profile and even if I cut away portions of the beam you will see that um, the beam shape is not moving, it is not changing, only the intensity uh, is reduced when I cut off the beam. So you see that um, this box allows me to have a constant uh, and nice beam profile so the Im image quality will not be deteriorated if this box for some reason might be disaligned. And the other advantage is that um, all the lasers that are fed into the fiber here on the side of the laser box will come out at the same position in the main optical unit and you will have uh, directly all the lasers that you are using in your setup overlaid in your image. So from this box basically the laser is fed uh, to the fiber and is outcoupled here uh, by a lens which transforms the beam that comes out of the fiber into um, a parallel beam. The parallel beam passes in this position a uh, shutter that allows me to switch off the excitation. Also you see here a filter holder that can be used to clean, further clean up the excitation beam uh, and is then passing the dichroic mirror which is sitting here. So in a normal confocal microscope the uh, dichroic mirror usually sits in a kind of cassette underneath uh, the table of the microscope. Here in our microscope, the dichroic beam splitter sits in the main optical unit. The, base, the laser is reflected by the main optical unit into the right side port of this Olympus IX71 microscope stand, and there a mirror reflects the light into the microscope objective, which focuses the light into the objective. So the advantage of using this kind of setup is that you have the uh, rear port of the microscope still fully available. For example, you see here uh, a lamp connected to this microscope, and you can also use the normal position of the um, uh, excitation uh, and of the uh, dichroic filter cube so you keep the full functionality of the system available. You can still connect the camera, use it as a wide field microscope or as a turf microscope. Um, basically, you just add the control option to this system.
So the laser is focused by this microscope objective. Läuft. So the microscope objective is, is uh, focusing the excitation beam into the sample. Um, in the sample, the fluorescence is excited, hopefully, and the fluorescence is collected by the same objective. So the fluorescence goes basically the same way back. Now, it obviously passes the dye correct because uh, usually fluorescence has longer wavelengths than the excitation beam, and the dye correct is uh, manufactured in a way that it's only reflecting the laser light, but not the fluorescence light. The fluorescence comes also out as a parallel beam, is then focused by the tube lens onto the confocal pinhole, which is sitting here. The confocal pinhole. Stop. So the confocal pinhole uh, is in this case not adjustable but uh, replaceable, so you can select different types of uh, pinholes. In this case we have mounted a, five, a 15 micrometer pinhole and uh, the pinhole of course can be adjusted in X and Y. So the fluorescence light, as I said, is focused onto the pinhole. Uh, the pinhole rejects the out of focus light, so you have confocal sectioning and a nice small confocal volume in the orders of uh, femtoliters. Um, after the light is passing this uh, pinhole and the, all the autofocus light is rejected, we have another lens that is um, transforming the beam again into a parallel beam. So we can basically do whatever we want with the detection light after here. So we can extend into different detector boxes or put this into uh, a multi-mode fiber for spectral analysis, for example. And this is done by these uh, kind of tower-shaped uh, objects here. And these towers contain different beam-splitting optics housed in uh, standard filter cubes. You can see this here. In that case, for example, we have mounted in this position that is now in the beam a mirror and here a polarizing beam splitter. So you can see that you can have different options here and of course those filter cubes can also contain uh, dipoid beam splitters in order to measure threads. So you can for example see the uh, acceptor channel in one of the detectors and the donor channel in the other detector. And this is of course modular. In the simplest case you would just have this uh, tower in order to switch the uh, emission between detector 1 and detector 2. Here this second tower uh, is responsible for directing the light, for example, to this access port you can see on that side here where you can connect the spectrometer, for example, or whatever other detector you might like to connect to the system. This tower directs the light either to the first two detectors or to the detector extension box, uh, which can be used, for example, to house a couple of PMTs in case you want to do measurements in the UV range. So as I said in the beginning, this machine is specifically designed to, um, single, for single molecule applications. And now for single molecule application, the first uh, obvious question that you might pose is how we actually find your sample. In a normal confocal microscope, you put your sample, you use the eyepiece or you use the scanning of the microscope to find your sample and uh, basically focus while you're looking at the sample. Now when you're thinking of single molecules, this is not possible for a couple of reasons. First, in the IPC you can't see the single molecules because they don't have any absorption contrast or so. Um, and with fluorescence, you might be able to find them, but usually fluorescence uh, single molecules are bleaching quite fast, uh, and um, your sample will be damaged before you actually even find this, before you have a chance to do actually measurement. So the idea here is that uh, you take a different uh, property of the sample that you more or less know where your sample is with respect to something that you can actually find in your sample. And this something that you can find in your sample is usually the mounting um, of your sample, so that means a cover slide, for example. And for that reason, this microscope contains something I haven't been talking about yet, and this is a, a, a camera that is sitting here. It's basically a beam diagnosis camera, so it's not used for imaging of the sample, but it is used to diagnose the excitation beam and the reflection that comes back from the sample. So you can see here at this position a 9010 beam splitter mounted in that way how my hand is now uh, posing and that means that 10% of the excitation light goes directly onto a power diode which measures the intensity of the laser that is used during the experiment. It also means that light that might be reflected from the sample will then be reflected from the dichroid because it has the same wavelengths as the excitation beam and will then be reflected by this 9010 beam splitter 
uh, onto the camera. So you can see the reflection of your sample on the uh, camera and that can be used to find the interface between glass and uh, your sample basically. And we will use this to find our molecule sample. So now I will start to uh, start the software of the system and we can have a look at uh, the camera image and the image of the, um, of the single molecules. So the system is controlled uh, by the simple time uh, software and the software controls the acquisition but it is also good for analysis of the sample and it can control several hardware features. When I start the simple time software uh, on this PC, unfortunately the resolution of the screen has to be very low now in order to record the video. Uh, this is why we usually use a big screen and normally a higher resolution. Basically, this uh, uh, acquisition and uh, analysis software consists uh, of two planes. On the left hand side, you see, uh, or you will see when we record actually something, the workspace re representation, which is representing the folder where all your data gets stored. And on the right side, uh, this is used for the analysis windows or for the acquisition previews. So, I have to start uh, by creating a new workspace because the system has to know where it actually wants to uh, and it has to uh, store its data. We will just call this demo now. And um, I can now bring up the data acquisition uh, window which contains in this representation now the video image from the camera. So we will start by putting our sample now on the microscope and see if we can find the cover glass that contains the single molecules. So this is how our sample looks like and uh, it does look a little bit more fancy than it actually is. This is because we uh, have mounted a cover glass that contains uh, our single molecules in a PVA film. And this cover glass has been mounted on this aluminium frame just in order to prevent dust, uh, dust from, from getting on the sample and for the sake of being e more easy to transport. So in theory, it's just a, a cover glass, or in practice, it's just a cover glass containing the single molecules embedded in a, a polyvinyl alcohol film. So what we have here is a 60 times water immersion, a 60 times magnification water immersion objective. This is a high numerical aperture objective, and high numerical aperture objectives are key for measuring single molecules because they allow you to focus tight and to collect the photons that are emitted from a broad um, angular range. That means that I have to put immersion fluid, and this is in this case water. We have to make sure that the water is very pure and does not contain any impurities. So normal distilled water is probably not a good choice. You should go for the best uh, chromatic, uh, uh, best uh, water you can get. So purified for spectroscopic uh, applications. So I put a drop of water and then put my sample on top of the microscope stand. And in order to get all the light out, I will put a light protection cover on top of this. So now comes the focusing and we will use the camera. So we have the sample on our stage now and uh, I will switch on the laser and we will use the camera image to do the focusing. For that uh, purpose we have a small remote control that I have here in my hand and this allows me to actually control uh, the laser and the excitation light and also when the vectors are switched on when I'm away from the computer. You can switch this to manual control and then open the excitation shutter and you see already on the uh, screen that we have light coming onto the camera. So I move the focus to the downward position so I'm pretty sure that I'm not touching the sample and that I'm also uh, quite far away from the sample and I know which direction I have to turn the focus in order to approach the sample. So in this case I have of course to go up and when I do this you will see that the image on the screen is moving and is transforming a little bit. Now it gets brighter, so this means that we are approaching the sample and we will get a stronger reflection. So now this is the reflection that we see and we can use an attenuator in front of the camera to attenuate the light a little bit uh, in order not to overexpose the camera and we see the reflection image here. So now this is the reflection that we get when we are approaching the sample from the lower side. That, is, that means that this is the reflection that is caused by the interface between the immersion fluid and the lower side of the cover glass. So I know that our sample is on the upper side of the cover glass, so we 
have to go up further actually to see the second reflection that is caused by the interplay between the glass and the water. So this is the upper side of the cover glass that we are targeting. And then I move further up, we see the three of the rings uh, as we are in the glass and I can now uh, or increase the intensity on the camera in order to still see the image. And after some time we will get another reflection. This one here, and this should also be brighter than the first one because the mismatch of index of reflection between air and glass is higher than between water and glass. So I can attenuate uh, the camera a little bit and we defer maybe also the laser intensity in order to see the focus more precisely. And that point now where I have the smallest image on the camera screen. Uh, is the place where the laser focus is now directly uh, on top of the cover glass. And now we will start imaging at that point. Okay, so now we switch to the computer and uh, since I'm now sitting uh, at the computer and not at the microscope, I will use the uh, shutter control in order to operate the shutters from the computer. I also have to think about switching on the detectors, which we haven't done yet, so I will do this. Uh, so the detectors are on. And I have uh, selected detector 1 to be open, so the shutter in detector 1 is now open and um, all the light will go to the shutter, uh, to detector 1. So detector 1 is selected, that means all the light that is coming from uh, our objective, that fluorescence, is going to detector 1. I don't have to open the excitation shutter, this will be done automatically during the acquisition process. So the data acquisition window has uh, two tabs, one is the video tab that we already saw, and the other one is the scanning tab that is controlling the image acquisition. So now we have uh, here the whole field of view, 80 by 80 micrometer and 150 pixel resolution for the pre-scan. The pre-scan is basically allowing us to uh, select the area that we are interested in and that we want to record later. So I will press pre-scan to see where we are actually are, where we actually are. So now the scanner is calibrating and the scanning will start. So the scanning in this microscope is rather slow because we are using a piezo scanner. But that's not a big problem for single molecule measurements because anyways the fluorescence of single molecules is rather low. So you can't scan very fast because you need a certain number of photons to be collected to have a nice statistics to analyze your image. So this image uh, looks a little bit speckly. Uh, speckly. And those are probably those single molecules that I will I am expecting to see, uh, which we can't really see here in this uh, big field of view because our resolution is not uh, high enough. So we can make this a little bit brighter by changing the scale and selecting a region of interest um, where we will zoom in. Therefore, I can switch this uh, I could, uh, this window to set region of interest mode. And then instead of having a small loop, I can select here a frame uh, where we will have a closer look. And then select the resolution, let's say 250 pixels by 250 pixels, apply this and start the recording of the image. So you see the image coming up in the preview and already here in this preview uh, I can basically tell that those uh, blocks that we are seeing here are single molecules. And now the reason why I can tell this 
is that uh, as compared to, for example, other objects, they have these kind of interrupted patterns. And these interrupted patterns are coming from a typical single molecule um, property. So the acquisition has finished now, and I will just close this window in order to get a little bit more space on the, um, on the monitor. So what we have here on the left side, as I promised, we will see all our data files and already two analysis files have been created during the online preview. The first one is the comment file where you can annotate your experiment, a couple of uh, data that the system has uh, during the acquisition time is already, already, is already contained here. So this one contains the image, I will open it and we can zoom a little bit in here. And, um, maybe also get a lifetime histogram here. And as you can see that we basically have two different lifetime components in this image. I will just change the intensity scale and I'm sorry that I have to pen here a lot because the monitor or the screen resolution is too small. Let's set this to 50 so we can see something. So in this image you see, um, yeah, basically you see different blocks here. Those different blocks have also, for example, here a green color. This one is a more reddish guy. And um, the color representation is here plus this lifetime. The lifetime histogram is here. So you see you have just two different species coming up in this image, which would be, for example, the green one should be the one that is more or less in this histogram here. The red one is one guy more or less here to the right of this histogram. Now, if we close this histogram to get a little bit more space, we can discuss what we actually see here in terms of the shapes. So the most striking feature in this image is that uh, most of these guys here uh, that I consider already single molecules have this um, inter interrupted uh, structure. This one, for example, hasn't. Or this one is looks like half a circle, like it would uh, has been cut in half. And this is a typical single molecule feature because single molecules to show blinking and bleaching. And now if you, uh, rem uh, if you imagine that the image was scanned uh, in a line-by-line -line fashion, you can imagine that when a molecule blinks, it will be off for one line or for a few pixels and then go on again. That one, for example, probably bleached after it was scanned uh, half. That one didn't show any of those blinking, maybe just one uh, small spot here. So it might be actually not only one molecule. Um, the first thing that most people think is that they can distinguish the uh, number of molecules by the intensity of this image, uh, but that is kind of misleading because um, the intensity can be varying by a large number of things and the most, pro uh, most pro uh, prominent would be probably that uh, they are not uh, entirely in focus or that uh, they are orientated um, in a different uh, direction as the polarization of the laser beam is, and then also the intensity decreases. So now we are back in the acquisition window, and what I want to show you is that um, we can study these single molecules a little bit further by recording time traces of these molecules. So we can use this image uh, that we recorded before, where I just changed the scales a little bit to make it more apparent here on the camera, uh, to select one of those guys by using the uh, point acquisition mode and here also set region of interest. So with this uh, tool I can, for example, go to this guy here, select uh, my laser at that point and then start the oscilloscope. So like they say always in the cook shows, I have prepared this a little bit. What we have here on the left side is the oscilloscope window, which is basically showing me the count rate at a specific point that I can select in the data acquisition window here by placing this crosshair on one point that is interesting for us. So we will just choose this one here, point the laser there, and we see the intensity uh, of that point. And now what you saw here is that the molecule bleached in one step, and then it came back from the dead again, and uh, was progressing a little bit further, and then bleached again. So if we select this one, for example, You see that the intensity is different. Also, it seems the percent in the fluctuations look a little bit different. But if we wait for some time and observe the bleaching of this one, if it happens actually, right. 
<laughs> so normally the problem with this is that the uh, molecules are bleaching rather fast uh, and uh, you can't really see we anything. Mach neue Molekule. <laughs> we will just select another one because this is not dying. So let's let's take this one. Oh, now it bleached. So uh, you saw that it, even the intensity in the beginning was different from the first one I selected. It still bleached in one step, so it was also one molecule. And there you see that the intensity is not a good measure for the number of molecules that you have in your sample. So let's go for a blue one, maybe. So this means it should have a, a, a different fluids its lifetime, since here also the color representation is different. I select this one now. And apparently we bleached this one already during the acquisition of this image. So maybe that one here. So that was quite bright, but also very short-lived. Uh, maybe we take one of those guys here. Again, totally different linking behavior of this molecule. Also quite bright, but uh, a lot in this off state. It's still, uh, it's still going on. So the um, oscilloscope also features a TCSPC histogram panel where we can have a look at the flow since lifetime directly. So you see this um, refreshing every 300 milliseconds and that it allows me now, as we did before, to pick one all of these molecules and have a look at the flow since decay of, of this molecule. So I select this blue one here. And I think, yeah, we did it before. This is already bleached. So let's say uh, take this one and to see the fluorescence decay uh, coming up of this molecule. And maybe we see it bleaching as well, but I don't think so. Yeah. Now it bleached. And what we see now here is basically the instrument response function that is um, residual reflected laser light here of the, of the laser. Uh, let's check one out of the red ones maybe here. Okay, so that is apparently not there anymore. Maybe the blue one. Also we killed this one before probably. Maybe this one here. Yeah. So this one was still a little bit fluorescing and you probably saw that the uh, EK was faster here, so shorter process like that. Okay, so we uh, have a preview image here again, and in this preview image I will select one of these uh, single molecules and we will can have a look a little more detailed look on um, the fluorescence intensity evolution over time. So I will select one of those and we start recording um, a time trace. We start record. And now the system complains that it couldn't open the laser shutter and this is because I switched it to manual mode. So we can see the difference of the signal levels of uh, just the room light that is still coming into the system and uh, a light that is produced by the fluorescence dye and maybe also the background that comes from uh, reflection uh, of, of uh, residual laser light. So I start, and now I open the shutter. This switches the laser on, and we see the fluorescence intensity and the fluctuation of the fluorescence intensity, and now the bleaching of the molecule. If I switch off, the level, signal level goes even a little bit more down, and now we can stop basically the measurement because this is the and the dye has bleached. So this was a greenish molecule here, so maybe for the, for the next one we select one that was more bluish, or that one here. Again, start the recording. And open the shutter. And bleached again. Close the shutter. Stop the measurement. And maybe we select uh, that blue one here. Start to record. And then we'll open the shutter again. Maybe you can select this red one here. Finished. Okay. 
And maybe yeah, let's give one of my people. And then uh, the last one will be maybe this one here, this greenish guy. Start. Open the shutter. And we see kind of strange things happening. Maybe while this is happening, you also have not only a time trace, but also TCSTC curve, FCS and image. We switch to TCSTC curve, you see the process decay here uh, being built up. FCS, of course, is now not available uh, because this is not the solution something. So now we are uh, back uh, in the analysis uh, and we have all the data that was acquired here on the left side in our workspace. So let's check uh, point measurement uh, 8. Uh, I would uh, select the MCS trace, which is giving us the time trace. Here you can select the binning. I will just leave it at the standard value of uh, 1 millisecond and calculate the trace. So this here in the beginning was the time when I was talking. Uh, then switching on the laser and started uh, the molecule uh, blinking. Yeah, you can go through this uh, file here and see the behavior of this blinking. So now let's just select uh, this area here uh, and get the fluorescence lifetime. So basically we calculate the fluorescence lifetime for the whole time the molecule was actually uh, actively blinking. So I can select the TCSPC histogram recalculate this and I will get the TCSPC histogram of this uh, selected area. Here I can select the, uh, area, uh, the borders of the fit. In that case it is a tail fit and if I run the fit we get a process lifetime of 3.2 nanoseconds. In the contrast maybe to this one I can select uh, the other measurement that we took here, this 0.10 measurement get the MCS trace again, leave the same binning settings up, and we see this is already quite different here. This was a different, a different molecule where we had uh, slightly different blinking behavior. So we will do the same, select here maybe this area uh, and restrict the calculation of the fluorescence lifetime to the time where the molecule was actually blinking. Calculate the fluorescence lifetime as well. Um, maybe just for this area, and do a fitting, and now the process lifetime of that one is smaller, it is 1.6 nanoseconds.